Boker Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benuni. You're watching Israeli News Live. And for those of you that watched our broadcast last night and had trouble with the audio, I'm actually revisiting this story here, the first half of it anyway, not the, uh, the Russian news side of this, but because it is very important that you get this and understand what's going on. And I'm going deeper into this in this broadcast here with some more information. We've retitled it, Pope Francis' words echo through time. And I think when you get this to see this, this, uh, this morning or this evening, whenever it is for you, you will really understand exactly what I'm talking about here. So let's get right into this particular article here. Uh, it goes back further, but this is what kind of has re reignited this issue. Pope Francis meets with the evangelical Pentecostal leaders in a John 17 spirit interview. Now, it's interesting they call it a John 17 spirit interview, but we're going to go back and revisit where this all begins. Uh, and, but let's first get into this article here. Christian Post News, June 15, 2016, uh, reports here, Pope Francis and several prominent evangelical and Pentecostal leaders met in Rome last Friday to discuss areas of mutual agreement and where they respectfully disagreed. The aim of the gathering, which had no official agenda, was to build unity between Christian traditions that have historical enmity. The Reverend Dr. Geoff Tunicliffe, former Secretary General of the World Evangelical Alliance and Chairman of the Advisory Board of Christians Media Cooperation, said in an interview with the Christian Post Tuesday that there was a John 17, uh, excuse me, John 17 spirit during the two meetings he had with Pope Francis. Tunicliffe noted that formal meetings with Pope are often said to last only 30 minutes, but the informal meeting which Francis and evangelical charismatic leaders lasted over two hours. There is the gathering sense to the presence of God, according to Tunicliffe, in the unity of the Spirit as their discussions focused on Jesus Christ, even as they talked about theological differences. Now, yes, they are one. You have to remember that the Rome is the mother church. Uh, she is, even as Tony Palmer stated, uh, that they should return home to their mother, uh, you know, that she is the mother church. But we know there's one very provocative scripture in Revelation that speaks of the mother whore and that she has daughters. And yes, I do see those daughters coming home. And that's exactly what we're seeing take place even now. Um, a lot of people don't like that, but it is true. And Tony Palmer, though, is really the one that set the stage for Pope Francis on the John 17 uh, spirit here. And I want to share a little bit of this with you, and you'll see what I mean. He's, he's only going to speak about it, but, uh, but he's actually going to do the John 17 prayer. Just for a second, so listen to this. Alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, there is the, now there's more to that video than that, but the point is, is uh, this is where Tony Palmer went to the Kenneth Copeland uh, Ministry Summit there with all the big fish, as Tony calls them, and uh, he said he tells the Pope that they have uh, mega churches, 10,000, 2,000, and you know, they all have private jets, etc. He really exposes them, if you ask me. Uh, and they, of course, they claim it's not an agenda. It is an agenda. You can say it all you want that it's not, but it is an agenda. The John 17 is the agenda, but the thing is, you have to understand, Yeshua had nothing to do with mainstream religions. He was against the Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, he was trying to call them out. In fact, in Revelation 18.4, it says, uh, let me just read that to you. I didn't put that one up on the screen. But uh, in Revelation 18.4, very provocative scripture, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, and be ye not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. What plagues? The plagues that is going to come upon the Church of Rome are going to be poured out by the two witnesses. Now, in the book of Obadiah, it clearly speaks about those deliverers coming to bring judgment 
and to deliver the Mount of Mount Zion. And I'm going to get into that in just a moment, okay? But notice, come out of her, my people. Now that can be both Jew and Gentile, but friends, I'm telling you, it speaks more specifically to the Jews. All right? John is writing this book right here. John is a Jew. Now, I believe it is both Jew and Gentile that is trapped into this church, but you're going, you're given the chance all the way up until the time of the arrival of the two witnesses to get out of that system before he pours out the plagues upon this church, this evil system. Okay? Now, Remember also, like I said, she is a mother church. That's in Revelation 17, 5. And upon her forehead was written the name written, excuse me, written, <clears throat> written Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So the daughters are coming home. And not just in the uh, evangelical and Pentecostal and, 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 and uh, Lutherans and Episcopalians uh, who've all assigned the agreements to go back to Rome, but also we're finding that the Catholic Church is bringing home the Muslims where they created the Muslim religion. We know this by uh, Alberta Rivera, the former Jesuit, that, that, that spilled the beans on Rome on this. I mean, this is, this is absurd, guys. Are you serious? All right, so we have these proofs here in the Bible of what they're doing. And so what do we have here then? If the Catholic Church is claiming to be like Christ and to unify them as one, then you have what? An antichristo spirit. Antichristo, the Greek word for antichrist, is not meaning against Christ, but it literally is a pseudo-Christ. It is one that is like Christ. This is what the word anti in Greek actually means. It is something that is similar to, but it's a, in other words, it's a forgery. I've said quite frequently in the last months and everything that what is the papacy trying to do? They're trying to fake a millennial reign. We see in Daniel 11, I believe that's verse 14 even, that the sons of the lawless of thy people... Uh, I'll pull that up as well. There's several things that come to my mind as I'm doing this, and I forget to put it in the video clips here. But Daniel 11, um, yes, it's actually right there. It's verse 14. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves. And it's literally in Hebrew. It is the sons of the lawless of thy people. Uh, they will they will try, to, it says here, to establish the vision, but it says they will try to marry the vision. All right? That may even identify who the king of the south really is. Now, friends, you got to understand, who were, that, who were those lawless sons? I always knew that Shimon Perez was one because in 1993 and 94 he sold Israel out. And he came in there and made that agreement with the Vatican to give them Jerusalem, to give them so much of the land of Israel, whatever they wanted, he'd give it to them. He even said he'd bring in a United Nations force. Now we have, as we had in the interview recently, Shimon Tov. Shimon Tov shows you as well. He's seen, he was born in Israel, did go to America, but then he came back. He's been there 18 years. He saw the infrastructure for the last 13 years of them preparing for a two-state solution. We see the exact same things. So friends, I mean, you are watching these things come to pass right before your eyes. Everything is fulfilling to the dot. And the Pope of Rome, what is he doing? He's trying to, to make a two-state solution. The sons of the lawless, Shimon Perez, and then we find out Ariel Sharon actually signed a two-state deal with him. But what derailed it originally? Yasser Arafat wouldn't accept a, 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 a temple, a third temple on the Temple Mount. And what we find out recently as well, what happened we, in, the rabbi, in the interview with Yehuda Glick, when Paul Begley was doing that interview and I was there filming it, and we even were able, allowed to use the footage in that, Yehuda Glick says that the two-state two state solution, there is no more. It's over. It's finished. He says they can talk, do what they want. Why? He's holding out for that third temple. But believe me, as soon as that third temple is signed, the two-state solution is right back on again. Because the two-state solution is already signed. Only we're seeing that people like Yehuda Glick, 
and no doubt Netanyahu are trying to derail the system because of that third temple issue so that they can call it off. I, I, I applaud them for trying to derail it, but it's going to happen anyway. It's got to happen. There's just no way around it. Anyway, John says here, though, this is Jesus' quote, Father, I will that also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou dost love, before, love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, that these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and I declare it. And that, uh, that's not the actual part he was reading there. Uh, he's reading about where they would know that, that, that I am in you and that, that we are one. And this is exactly what the Pope is trying to do. He's trying to bring about a oneness, a uniting, but it's under an Antichrist spirit. So you're going to unite, and that is true, because Yeshua is coming to unite his true bride with himself, and Satan is trying to unite his bride, friends. He's uniting his bride, and the Pope of Rome is doing exactly that. He's uniting his bride for Satan, which is an antichrist spirit. No other way to say it. I have to say it that way. And I have proof in this, in the very title of this video here, his words are echoing through time. Now, here's where we get into the interesting stuff. Tony Palmer delivers a video uh, about Pope Francis' message to Kenneth Copeland at his pastor's conference on January 21st, 2014 at the Kenneth Copeland Ministries. All right? Now, I want you to see this. I got a little video clip here. Watch what the Pope of Rome says here. I am nostalgic, which means yearning, that this separation comes to an end and gives us communion. Okay? Now, notice that communion. I am yearning of that embrace. Now, that may seem like just words of trying to bring together people. And I don't say that Pope Francis is not sincere when he says this. I believe he is sincere about it. But the thing is, what you don't understand is the spirit behind this yearning. What is, what is this? What is he saying when he says, I am yearning of that embrace? Friends, this is the spirit of Esau crying out in this man because he lost the birthright. And I'm going to prove this to you because the Romans, through the Catholic Church, is, a, is the Edomite spirit. But remember, inside of this church is God's own people. He says, come out of her, my people. Both Jew and Gentile alike is in this church and God wants them to come out. Why would you go join in with it when God is telling you to come out of it? All right, now, let me show you what I mean when I say, when he says, I am yearning of that embrace. He is fulfilling, his voice is echoing through time from Esau himself, when Esau's brother, Jacob, who becomes Israel after he wrestles with God. And remember, Israel's going through that right now. Right now, Israel today is the spirit of Jacob. It's still a deceiving type of spirit. Do whatever they can to survive. Well, God bless them. I understand they're trying to survive, but they've got to wrestle with God. The time is coming. They've got to wrestle with God in order for them to overcome and become a prince with God. And Jacob, excuse me, not Jacob, but Esau here, is angry with his brother because he has taken his birthright. And the spirit of Esau is upon the Pope of Rome when he says, I am yearning of that embrace. What did Esau do in Genesis 27, verse 38? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Because Jacob had taken that birthright. Jacob also took his blessing. And Pope Francis, it's that spirit of Esau. It's still crying out. He wants the favor of God, but he can't seem to get it. And Israel, today, they're called Israel, but really they're not. They're still Jacob. 
They have not wrestled with God. They have not fulfilled Zechariah chapter 12, where they will look upon him whom they have pierced or whom they have thrust through. And then they will separate each one to their own family and they will mourn as a, as a family that lost their only son. How did you get these wounds? And he says, in the house of my friends. This is the wrestling time that Israel is fixing to go through. This is when their name will truly be changed from Jacob to Israel. And while they're going through that, what is the Pope doing? He is, he is experiencing what Esau experienced all those years ago, some nearly 4,000 years ago. He's experiencing the same feelings and emotions of Esau, yearning for that embrace. Why? Because his father has left him. Isaac is not there now. Now, I'm going to prove this to you. Let me show you. Some of you that might say, well, no. What, is, what has Rome got to do with Esau? All right, now keep in mind, this doesn't mean that every person that's born a Roman citizen is a descendant of Esau. And any descendant of Esau could easily also become a true believer if they so seek God the same way. God's, God's not a respecter of persons, okay? So don't get me wrong. This is a spiritual matter here. But it is also a physical matter as well, because as we know, the Pope of Rome, both his parents are Italians. They are Romans. And remember, Hadad, he was the sole surviving heir of Esau that escaped into Egypt, raised in the Pharaoh's house, just like Moses was. When he becomes of age, wants to go home to his people, he doesn't go to Adam or to, 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 to the region uh, that the Edomites lived in, the, the Esau's descendants. He goes to the land of Syria, becomes the king of Syria, in fact. So he, you know, he, now he married an Egyptian girl. It was the sister to the wife of the Pharaoh of Egypt. So again, he's doing like his fathers always did, mixing in amongst the, uh, the Arabic peoples of the world. He goes there to Syria, becomes the king of Syria. His descendants marry the Syrians. That's why they have such a great relationship. Rome and the Syrians and the Sunnis today have always had a good relationship. Why? Because they're blood relatives. Now, right now, there seems to be a family feud uh, because uh, Rome is not too happy, not because of the Sunnis, but because there's a Shiite power in Syria. That's why he hates Bashar al-Assad. The Shiites are not the family. The Sunnis are his family. This is why the Syrian war is going on. He needs to topple Bashar al-Assad in order to put the man back in power that's a Sunni. That's what the Pope wants to do. And he's making sure his Roman army, the Pope, uh, Obama and the NATO, that they're going to do this. All right. Now, Obadiah chapter 1, verse 6, only one chapter. How are the things of Esau searched out? So it's all about Esau. How are his hidden things sought up? Drop down to verse 10. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. Speaking about Esau. All right, now, some people, but they say, well, this was dealing, this is regarding Babylon. Because Obadiah the prophet prophesied this is, is believed to be around the mid of the 5th century B.C. All right, now, but you have to remember, what does Revelation speak about? Mystery Babylon. And technically, legally, by blood right, we can trace the genealogy of Esau all the way to Rome. The Jews believe it as well. Any, any good rabbi, all the historical evidence, they know the Romans today are the Edomites. Okay, now, he goes on, verse 12, But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. This is clearly speaking of a prophetic event where Israel would be facing the calamity of 70 A.D. Thou shouldest not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked upon their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands upon their substance. Did they lay hands upon their substance? Sure they did. Carried it right back into Rome. 
All right, now I realize we could go back into history and say, well, this happened during the Babylonian time when Jer what Jeremiah prophesied of, but it's only a repeat of history. This is why God identifies in Revelation mystery Babylon, that mother of whores, and everything repeated, and everything that is written there. Titus, the Roman general, he stood aloof, he stood on the other side but he was as one of them. But while the Syrians did all the dirty work, sure, it's Rome. So there's your Esau spirit. So when I tell you right here that when he says, I am yearning of that embrace, that is the spirit of Esau crying out from the Pope of Rome, wanting the embrace of his father Isaac, to get the embrace of Abraham, Isaac. But Jacob got that blessing. And he longs for it, and he's trying to make it happen through sons of the lawless in Israel, but he can't seem to pull it off. Oh my gosh. Obadiah 1.16, also another prophecy never fulfilled until recently. It was fulfilled on May the 26th of 2014. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and swallow down and shall be as though they had not been. All the nations. God is going to gather all the nations down to Israel for battle. Is that not right? Now notice what it says. Kika shashatetem. See, that is in the masculine plural. For as you have drunk, see, for as you have drunk, masculine plural, al hakodeshi. Upon my holy mountain, that's Mount Zion. If you go to the very next verse, verse 17 declares that my holy mountain is Mount Zion. All right? Masculine plural. What did the Pope of Rome do? He went there on the mountain, had the communion service, and his own news agency reported that it was men only. He was trying to reenact the Last Supper with his own disciples and friends. He had a communion service, and he put a triple crown upon his head, as you see here, to declare himself the King of Israel, to declare himself the Messiah, and to act as if he were the Messiah. He is longing for the embrace of his father, and he cannot get it. It also says, Ishatu kol hagoim. That is gender inclusive in the plural, and the nations or the Gentiles will continually drink where? Upon the holy on his holy mountain. Now when it says continually drink, see? Tamid. That's the word for continually. Tamid. You cannot apply this any longer to Babylon of the ancient days. Now you have to apply it to the mystery Babylon because it's continually tamid. tamid. And that's exactly what they did, though, even in the modern days here. The Pope of Rome goes in, men only, and have communion service. Then after he leaves Rome, guess what? Both men and women come all from all over the world, Gentiles, and they're having communion services there in the upper room for Fulfilling Obadiah 1.16. Friends, you're seeing prophecy manifest before your eyes. Now watch what it says on Vatican Radio here. Pope Francis, homily in the upper room. He celebrated Mass in the upper room, the cynical, in Jerusalem on Monday afternoon on the final day of the three-day pilgrimage of the Holy Land. Below, please find the full text of the Holy Father's homily, as they said. God, forgive me for even saying that word. Anyway, the upper room reminds us of the... I'll only put one part of it. Reminds us of the birth of the new family, the church established by the risen Jesus, a family that has a mother, the Virgin Mary. Christian families belong to this great family. And in, they, in, in it, they find the light and strength to press and, and be renewed. Amid the challenges and difficulties of life, all God's children of every people and language are invited and called to be a part of this great family as brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the one Father in heaven. Do you see his cry to bring the people together. This is where it started. He's trying to bring about the John 17 spirit. But see, friends, that's an antichrist spirit. You know, I'd have more respect for him just to be a, be a man and a brother, a step down and put up, get rid of all the crowns and stop all the nonsense and say, look, you know, do, do something different. Not this right here. This is trying to type out Jesus Christ and he's not Jesus Christ, friends. You just don't do that. 
You don't come in there. You don't come in there and put on your triple crown and try to be God. Claiming to be. Sitting right there, you know, where they had given an official seat to him. Right here, op-ed exclusive, a seat for the Pope at King David's tomb. Israel National News by Guglio Maiotti, February 1st, 2013. An historic agreement has been drafted between Israel and the Vatican. The Israeli authorities have granted the Pope an official seat in the room where the Last Supper is believed to have been taken, uh, taken place. On Mount Zion... In Jerusalem, and where David and Solomon, Jewish kings of Judea, are considered by some researchers to be also to be buried. They are buried there. My friends, you are seeing the spirit of Esau rise up. You're also seeing that soon that Israel has got to wrestle through. She's not Israel, really. She's still Jacob. That's why so many people are confused. They see that deceiving type of spirit. She's not wrestled through yet. Remember, though, Obadiah also speaks about, in the very last part of the verse there, let me see if I can pull that out for you real quick here. Obadiah states in the last verse, and deliverers or saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. They have made it the Mount of Esau. How did they make it the Mount of Esau? They took Mount Zion and made it the Mount of Esau. Why? Because you let the Pope of Rome be crowned as a king on there, and he is an Edomite, according to Obadiah. But saviors, remember, and it perfectly dovetails, friends, it's dovetailing with the very prophecy of Revelation 18, 4, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. See? And he says right here that saviors are going to come up upon the Mount of Zion to deliver. See? And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Come out of her before that judgment takes place. Now you know who's sitting on, now you know who's sitting on Mount Zion, okay? He's sitting on Mount Zion. There your guy is. He's made it into the Mount of Esau. I've proven to you by Obadiah already, and there's other places. Uh, Ezekiel 35 also proves that Esau's descendants are the Romans of today. How much more evidence do you need? Why are you still looking for an Antichrist? Jeez, Father God, help us, Lord. My friends, thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for bearing with me to redo this broadcast. I think it will be a greater blessing for you today. Again, don't forget us. We need your continued support in making these things possible. You make this happen, and we love you and thank you for it. God bless you, and shalom.